Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for the gospel. We praise you that though we were your enemies, Lord Jesus, you died for us. We praise you, Lord, that though we were powerless, though we were sinful, though we were unable to do anything to please you, though our lives were completely abhorrent before your holiness, we praise you that you have made us the objects of your grace. We praise you, Lord, that you have taken we who deserved your curse and has showered every blessing upon us through the gospel. And Lord Jesus, as we consider now your word, as we consider now what it means to be blessed as your people, Lord, as we consider those who are on the outside, those who are under your wrath, we pray now, Lord, that you would help us to be thankful for all that you have accomplished for us. We pray that you would be, help us to be hopeful for the joy that we will have with you in eternity. And we pray, Lord, that those who hear this message, who hear this text, who are still under your holy wrath, that they would flee to Christ, that they would flee from the wrath to come. For we pray this confident that your word will accomplish that for which you sent it through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing our studies in the gospel according to Luke. And this morning we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. Luke 6, verses 17 to 26. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great, with a, and with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the, sea, and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. He lifted up, lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the word of our Lord. On the night of March 11th, in the village of Kodometla, Odisha, India, 30-year-old Kama Sodi and his wife, Bimeshwari began to pray. Now this was the regular practice that they would pray before going to bed, but suddenly villagers stormed into the house threatening to kill them. The villagers were angered that Kama had become a Christian and that he'd been sharing the gospel with other villagers and especially that three other families had come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. But thankfully, Bimashwari was able to keep their children, aged, their two children, aged six and three, from harm as they begged the attackers to stop. The mob said that they would stop only if Kama renounced Christ and returned to their tribal animism. But the next morning they returned, this time with about 60 people, and they mercilessly beat Kama with sticks until he stopped moving. His family was terrified, thinking that he was dead. 
as he lay motionless on the floor. The mob threw the family's belongings out of the house and commanded them to leave the village. But when leaders from the church arrived and discovered that Kama was unconscious, but he was alive. So they rushed him to the hospital, and doctors were concerned that he wouldn't survive, that he remained in a coma for a day and a half, but then he amazingly regained consciousness. About a week later, he was discharged from hospital and was able to go home. And he's home even now at this moment, but he's not able to return to work because he has blood clots in his brain, and they're concerned that those blood clots would be dislodged and that he would die. When the family returned home, they found that most of their belongings had been stolen, that mud had been strewn throughout their house. And Bimashwari, who's, she's now trying to find work, but, but on March 22nd, when the government um, initiated a lockdown because of the coronavirus, she was unable to find any work. And this is being exacerbated by the fact that nobody wants to give her any work. The family's being ostracized. At the village, the other women throw Bimashwari's pots aside and as they fill theirs first. The women look at her and spit and turn away. But despite these horrific circumstances, Bimashwari demonstrates great faith. She said, I have no money or food to feed my children, but I have Jesus and he will provide for us. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who are blessed and those who are cursed. Which category would you put this family in? Now we prayed for them early in this, earlier in the service. Our, our hearts break for this family. They, they suffer trials that we can't even imagine. They're suffering even as we speak. But our passage this morning reveals that they aren't cursed, that they are in fact Blessed. In this passage, the Beatitudes, as they're often called, Jesus pronounces four blessings and four woes. The Beatitudes, as presented in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 to 26, mark the beginning of what is often referred to as the Sermon on the Plain. It's parallel to the Sermon on the Mount that you find in Matthew 5 to, Matthew 5 to 7. These Beatitudes, that sermon as well, begins with Beatitudes. Now, although the Beatitudes and the ethical components that follow in both sermons are similar, there are also some key differences that I, I think make these two distinct sermons. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but, but not only are the woes that Luke speaks about here absent from the Sermon on the Mount, but the timing and the context and the location in which this, the sermon seems to take place, takes place seem to be different. More importantly, the focus on both passages seems to be different. Now, while there is an ethical component that's a focus of both, the focus on the Sermon on the Mount is how the Pharisees are wrong about the law and obedience to God. Whereas in Luke, the Sermon on the Plain, while it still focuses on the ethics of the kingdom of God, there is no indication that this is anything to counter the false teaching of the Pharisees. Now, the reality is it's not uncommon for preachers to preach the same material or similar material on different occasions. There are a few of my sermons that I've preached in multiple settings. Moreover, as you have, have sat under my ministry for, for several years, you know that there are many similar themes that are recurring from sermon to sermon. So here in the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus contrasts those who have received blessing from God and those who will receive woe. This passage focuses on the eternal blessings that only God can bestow. Whereas those who live for this world and what the world has to offer are cursed. So here we see the citizen of the kingdom of God compared to the citizen of the world. Both are diametrically opposed. The four present circumstances described here in the blessings and the woes are polar opposites, as are the future consequences. Each circumstance is also the opposite of what the world lauds and what the world desires. And in this passage, we, we see that God's ways are not man's ways. We see that God's wisdom is not man's wisdom. We see that God's values are not man's values. J.C. Rao says that the state of life which our Lord blesses, the world hates. 
Well, the opposite is also true, isn't it? The state of life that the world loves, the Lord curses. Nevertheless, as Bach points out, one should be careful not to take these generalized beatitudes and absolutize them as if one's bank account or social status automatically determines one's spiritual state. We'll see that what Jesus is speaking about here is much deeper than temporal circumstances. Bach continues, the Beatitudes declare the hope of God's transformation and blessing to all who will come to receive it. Now, if you remember, in our last passage from two weeks ago, Jesus had come down the mountain after spending the whole night in prayer, and then he called the twelve apostles. So verse 17 picks up after that passage. So first we see that Jesus ministers to a great multitude in verses 17 to 19. Jesus ministers to a great multitude. So as we continue this morning, Jesus comes down the mountain with the 12 apostles. With his chosen men, Jesus is beginning a new phase of his ministry. And he stands here on a plain and a great crowd gathers. Although the Pharisees have maliciously rejected Jesus, Jesus is continuing to gain popularity among the common people. And so people come from from all over Israel, even Gentiles from as far as Tyre and Sidon on the Mediterranean coast have come to Jesus. The crowds came to hear him. They came to be healed by him. His demonstration of power in word and deed, is drawing them. We're told here that, that power came out from, of him as he healed them all. So Jesus here is demonstrating his authority over diseases and over demons, as, as we've seen repeatedly already. Jesus is overcoming things that have sought to destroy humanity. We see Jesus here, these are even a, a, a parable, in a sense, and a living parable, as Jesus is overcoming the curse. But as we'll see here, coming to Jesus for healing, or even to listen to him, is not enough. There are actually three groups of people here. We have the 12 apostles, we have a a wider group of disciples, and then we have the crowds. And from these groups, both kinds of people that we spoke about earlier are represented. Those who are blessed and those who are cursed. In verse 20, Jesus begins to speak. He lifts up his eyes on the disciples and speaks, pronouncing the Beatitudes. And again, although many are present here, Jesus is focused on his followers. He looked upon his disciples. There are many examples in the scriptures of of a pronouncement of blessings and a pronouncement of woes. Those who do this are blessed and those who do that are cursed. One key example is Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 to 28. As the nation of Israel is about to enter the promised land, the Lord speaks through his servant Moses. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. But here, Jesus is doing something new. This is at the outset of the, the, the new covenant in Christ. And so the, the focus here is not about do this and you will live. Jesus is, is saying something else distinct from that here. So first of all, in, in verses 20 to 23, Jesus pronounces blessings. Now, Jesus is not teaching here four steps to being blessed. It's not as though he's saying, okay, well, you have to be poor, you have to be hungry, you have to be sad, and you have to be hated in order to be blessed. Jesus is not telling his disciples how to be blessed. Jesus is telling his disciples who is blessed. Jesus is here describing disciples. He's describing what disciples look like in this life, and he's also offering them hope beyond their temporal circumstances to their eternal circumstances. When we think about the the temporal circumstances that, that Jesus is describing here, who would want them? Who wants to be poor? Who wants to be hungry and sad and hated? 
there's a grave danger in caught, getting caught up in the circumstances of this life. But there's also a danger of just looking at these things superficially, of not asking the question of the text, what does Jesus mean here? What is Jesus saying here? Well, first of all, we have to define the word blessed. This word is sometimes translated happy. And so this passage is sometimes translated, happy are the poor, happy are the hungry, etc. But happy doesn't do this word justice. Blessed is much better. It's not just a better word. Blessed is also a better state. You can be happy and not be blessed. You can be happy with a bottle of tequila, but you will not be blessed. Blessedness is not merely a, a transient emotion. Blessedness is a state of being. It's a state of being that comes from being approved by God. Blessedness, true blessedness, comes from being one on whom God is smiling. So the people that are described by Jesus here are approved by God. They are citizens. They are citizens. So they are Christians. They are citizens of the kingdom of God. So first of all, blessed are the poor. Verse 20b. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So again, we need to ask the question, who is Jesus describing? What does it mean when Jesus talks about someone who is poor? Again, don't just look at this superficially. Jesus declared at the outset of his ministry in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, Jesus here is not speaking about socioeconomic status. He's not talking about temporal circumstances. Now, there is a sense in which in which material poverty really typifies what Jesus is speaking about here. What matters is not how much money you have. What matters is your relationship with Jesus. Jesus is not talking about your bank account. Jesus is talking about your heart. And here the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount provide insight. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying here, blessed are those who have a poor state of heart. Those who are, have a poor state of heart, those who are, are poor in spirit, know that they need Jesus. Do you know that you need Jesus? I mean, the reality is that everybody needs Jesus. The only one that didn't need to be saved was Jesus. Are you poor in spirit? That's really the starting point. If you don't have this one, you won't have any of it. If you are not poor in spirit, you are not a Christian. To be poor in spirit means that you understand your spiritual poverty. You understand that you have no righteousness of your own. You understand that all of your good deeds are like filthy rags. Think of Psalm 40, verse 17. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought from me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. The one who is poor in spirit has examined himself or herself according to God's law and see how far, how far short you fall. But the one who is truly poor in spirit doesn't stay there. You don't wallow in self-pity. You go to the cross. You go to Jesus and seek his righteousness credited to you. The one who is poor in spirit is rich in Christ. It is people like this who are the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And that's just what Jesus says here. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Yours is the kingdom of God. Now, most of the blessings that are, are presented here in the Beatitudes are future Right? Look at the, at the next one. You shall be satisfied. You shall laugh. But this is present. 
This is in the present tense. Yours is the kingdom now. You, you are right now a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Again, something we talk about often, the, the already, not yet. These are, are eschatological, there's eschatological terms that, that we, we have something, but we still also will look forward to. We, we right now, at this very moment, as we possess the down payment of our inheritance. But the fullness of our inheritance will come when Christ comes. We have the blessing of being citizens of the kingdom of, of heaven now, even though we are living in a foreign country. We will receive the fullness when the kingdom comes. And so then this, this relationship with Christ that we enjoy as those who are poor in spirit, and again, as those who, it's not just that you knew you needed Jesus then when you first heard the gospel, but you know that you need Jesus now. You know that you need Jesus every day. And the person that, that knows that, the person that has this relationship with Jesus has present and also future blessings. So the person then who is poor in spirit can suffer deprivation now because glory awaits. This is the hope. This is the hope for the family that we're praying for. This is the hope of all of our brothers and sisters who are struggling because of their faith or their, their, because of their, their persecution that they are experiencing because of their faith. They're awaiting future glory. But they know that they're citizens now. Well, the second beatitude that, that Jesus presents here is blessed are the hungry. Verse 21. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. That this pairing of, of poor and hungry isn't surprising, for poverty and hunger often go hand in hand. But once again, Jesus is not speaking here of temporal circumstances. He's not speaking about socioeconomic status. Once again, the Sermon on the Mount provides insight. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's not just those who, are, who, are, who have a, a lack of, of, of ability to provide for themselves. It's not just those who are on a diet. It's those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Theologian Leonard Gopeltis is helpful here. The hungry are men who both outwardly and inwardly are painfully deficient in the things essential to life as God meant it to be, and who, since they cannot help themselves, turn to God on the basis of his promise. These men and these alone find God's help in Jesus. They are not an existing social or religious group. They are believers who seek help from Jesus because of their own helplessness. Now this is contrasted by the citizens of the world that we'll talk about in a few moments who are consumed by earthly desires. Citizens of the kingdom of God are consumed instead with a desire for righteousness. For righteousness both in our own lives and righteousness in the culture around us. Are you hungry for righteousness in your own life? Do you look at God's word and see what, what the, the moral standards that God requires and understand that, that you fall woefully short of the righteousness that God requires? Now, many see that, but stay there. But do you see your lack of, of righteousness and the hunger for it? Do you hunger to go to Christ? Do you hunger to go to Christ for the only real righteousness that, that you have is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ credited to your account? Do you know where to go for righteousness and do you go there? Like Martin Luther said, we are all beggars. This is true, but he also once said that we are all mere beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. When I stand up here and proclaim God's word, I'm just a beggar like you, seeking to show, show you where the bread is. The bread is of Jesus Christ. Are you hungry for something more than anything that this life has to offer? Are you satisfied? 
Those who have fled to Christ for the imputed righteousness of Christ will also seek to grow in righteousness. They will hunger for righteousness in, as they walk through this life. Seeking to live righteously in the strength that God provides. Not just content, and also not just content to live in a corner, just doing your own thing, but also concerned about the lack of righteousness that you see out there in the world. Seeking righteousness in the culture around you. Do you care about things like abortion and immorality, but God's name being blasphemed? Now, this is not the social gospel. This is as those who've been transformed by Christ, seeking the righteousness of Christ to go out into the world. To the hungry, like to the poor, Satisfaction is promised. Satisfaction of God, from God. Not just physical satisfaction, but spiritual satisfaction. Spiritual satisfaction. The answer to any present lack is finding your security in your relationship with God. Again from Bach, Daryl Bach. Blessed are you who sense your lack and depend on God, for God shall accept and reward you in the consummation. Now again, the focus, as Jesus says here, is there's a future component. But there's a present satisfaction as well, isn't there, by, in the fact that you will have a future satisfaction. Now think of, of times that, that I've been hungry. Maybe I'm, when I'm working hard physically, and my stomach is grumbling, and I'm, I'm really, really hungry, but I know that there's a steak dinner coming. Well, I'm I don't mind the, the hunger pains because I know they're pointing to the fact that, that those hunger pains aren't going to last forever. That there's a future hope of, of, and a promise of my hunger pains being abated. And the same is true, and infinitely more so, for our spiritual hunger. We can, can live with, not be satisfied with, but we can be content in the fact that we have a present lack because we have the fullness in Christ and because of that one day, all of those promises we finally and fulfilled at the return of Jesus Christ. Third beatitude. Blessed are those who weep. Verse 21b. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Now, Jesus here is not speaking about mourning over personal grief, but over spiritual grief. It's the same vein that we've seen forever. This is, this is not just transient. This is not just present or superficial. This is, this is grief ultimately over sin. Again, it's grief over your sin and the sin that you see around you. It's grief because God is not getting the honor that he deserves. Psalm 139, 136 my eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. And we're going to talk about this later on. But, but are you grieved over sin? Are you grieved over your sin and also over the sin of others? Now, when we think about, about mourning for sin, we realize that all mourning is going to cease in the kingdom of heaven, you shall laugh. We will rejoice at the consummation of all things. So here Jesus is seen as the fulfillment of the messianic blessing of, of Isaiah 61.3. That the Messiah will grant to those who mourn in Zion to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. This is a future hope. But again, it's something that you possess even now, you have received the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Does your experience bear this out? Are you able to have joy that transcends your present experience? This is, after all, part of the, the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is, is part of what the Holy Spirit does in, in the heart of the believer. And it's, it, has no, it has really nothing to do with your external circumstances, but because of your eternal circumstances. You don't interpret scripture by your temporal experience. You filter your experience through the grid of scripture. 
Now, as you keep these, these truths in mind, you're able to testify of, of this joy in the midst of trials, of, of God's comfort in the midst of difficulty. Now, when I reflect on the trials that I've experienced in my Christian life, I see again and again as the Lord drew me, that the Lord drew me near in the midst of those times. God's comfort is very real. And sometimes it is more real in the midst of trials. When you are a citizen of Christ's kingdom, you will be able to look back on your trials and you'll be able to testify even more powerfully of God's supernatural comfort, of God's peace that passes all understanding. But again, we are not yet in the not yet. So we experience a degree of pain in this life. We experience a sense of, 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 of present tears and grief in the midst of what we see going on around us. Even when we see our own sin, there's grief. And so though you're, you're growing in the knowledge of God's comfort as you walk through the trials and tribulations of this life, and although you're being transformed into the image of Christ through these trials, you still experience pain you still experience pain, again, because of your sin or because of the sin of others, or even just because of living in a fallen world. You still hurt when you have an argument with your spouse. You still hurt when a loved one dies. You still hurt when you sin against the Lord. And even though, so even though you experience this measure of comfort now, one day you experience comfort beyond anything that you can imagine. As you, as you experience the joys of heaven, when you experience perfect comfort, Revelation 21, 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall be there, there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things have passed away. Those who mourn, those who weep will laugh. They will laugh. The fourth beatitude, blessed are the hated. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Again, we see that these blessings are ultimately spiritual not socioeconomic. First of all, the disciple is hated. They're hated. Now this often happens when you take a, a public and potentially offensive position contrary to the things that the world values. People will, will hate you, but really ultimately they're hating Jesus in you. Because even sometimes by just not doing what they're doing, even by when you don't say anything, sometimes when you just by your actions do something different, they feel condemnation, even though you haven't said anything. And they will hate you for it. The disciple is excluded. They experience social ostracism. Now, in, in the culture which Jesus taught by Adhering to the teachings of Jesus, as we'll see in the book of Acts, it could lead to expulsion from the synagogue. In today's culture, you, you might even be shunned. Or in some cases, even put out of a church because you're holding to the true gospel. The disciple is reviled. They, they, they face slander and, and verbal attack. Again, because you are seeking to honor Christ, they have to slander your character. They, they don't have, they can't, they will look for anything that they can say to, to bring you down to their size. And if they can't find anything, they'll make something up or they'll, they'll blow up a character fault and make it huge because they don't like Jesus in you. They spurn your name as evil. Now, remember what, what name meant in that culture, that the name represented the whole person. 
The name represented the, the whole person. So this is, this is a very personal attack. The person is, is treated as evil, as unclean, and to be separated from. And all of this is because of the Son of Man. It's all because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now there's times that, that we can be hated or excluded or reviled or spurned as evil because of our own sin. Because we can be short-tempered or because we can be unclear in what we're trying to say or, or because we can be thoughtless or selfish. But what Jesus is speaking here is, is, is being hated because of him. Being hated because of him. Because of your allegiance to Jesus. Because you are, you are with Jesus. You are opposed to the world. And because you are opposed to the world, the world is opposed to you. And look at this in verse 23. We're the only command that's presented here. Rejoice and leap for joy. Now again, this is, this is mainly focused on a future hope. It's on that day. It's on the day of the return of Christ. Again, there's, there's, we can enjoy these things in the present tense, but he's speaking here primarily of a future rejoicing that we will have, a, a leaping for joy. We can rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. So we're thinking here now and focusing, meditating on the, the, the pleasures of heaven. They're greater than, than eye is seen or ear heard or has entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And be, because of this, this hope we have of our union with Christ in heaven, we can rejoice now because of our future hope. And notice that we're also told that we can, we can rejoice and leap for joy because for, at the end of verse 23, for so their fathers did to the prophets. So as you look back in the Old Testament, you, you see, look at the way Jeremiah and, and Isaiah and, and others were treated. They were, they were shunned. They were abused. They were, they were, were thrown in pits. They were, they were cut in half because of their allegiance to God. And so when you, when you're treated like this, you can rejoice because you're in good company. Because you are in good company with the prophets of old, with those men of God who were faithful, even to the point of giving up their lives. In Acts chapter 5, verses 41, we, we see the apostles, after they're being, being told by the council to be silent about the name of Jesus, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor because of the name. Have you experienced that when, when you have been rejected because of Jesus, because you have, and I'm, again, I'm not talking about, about being a jerk. I'm talking about because you have loved somebody and proclaimed the gospel to them because of, of your love for Jesus. Have you experienced this kind of shunning? Have you experienced people avoiding you or saying bad things about you, making fun of you? There's a certain joy that comes from that, isn't there? There's a certain, feel, you feel a little bit privileged even because you're suffering dishonor for the name of Jesus. We're on verses 24 to 26. Jesus pronounces woe. He pronounces woe. And this is only here in Luke. This part is not in the Sermon on the Mount. It's only here in the Sermon on the Plain where we find that the rich and the full and the laughing and the, the love from verses 24 to 26 are now contrasted with the, the poor and the hungry and the weeping and the hated of verses 20 to 23. Now these are not four groups of people, but these are two groups of people. One group of people that we just heard about in the Beatitudes and now one group of people that we hear about in the woes. Once again, Jesus has a different assessment of the things that the world values. Now here with this one group and these four characteristics, 
We think about the ways that the, the world and the pleasures of the world can lull someone into a spiritual sleep. But when Jesus pronounces woe here, he's not cursing them. Jesus is pronouncing that they're already cursed. As Leon Morris explains, woe is an expression of regret and compassion, not a threat. Woe is onomatopoeic. It's a word that imitates the sound it's describing, like crash or slam. Woe is the sound of pain and pity for the misfortune that awaits somebody who is accursed by God. So the first woe is woe to the rich. Verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Again, Jesus is not speaking here about temporal circumstances. Wealth is not, is, is not a bad thing in and of itself. This is addressed here. This is obviously not addressed to Jesus' disciples because obviously they weren't rich. Now, there might have been rich people in the crowds that, that Jesus had in mind here. But we think about, again, like we saw with the poor, there's a certain way of, of looking at things that is characterized by those who are the, the self-reliant rich. Those who, who rely on themselves, not on God. Jesus says that they have received their consolation. They have received comfort in this life. Think about the rich man and Lazarus. When, the, 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 when Lazarus is, is outside of, of the rich man's gates and, and the rich man refuses to help him, instead enjoying the comforts that the rich man had, well, they both died. The, the poor man, Lazarus, went to heaven and the rich man went to hell. Jesus says that, that you have received your consolation. Lazarus has received difficulty, but the rich man had received comfort. So again, we're not, Jesus is not speaking here ultimately about, about those who are rich in, in possessions. Many, there are many wealthy people who follow Jesus. We think about Joseph of Arimathea, who we'll, we'll meet later on in Luke's Gospel. There, there are, this is not about external things. This is about heart. Luke 12, 21. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself, now hear this, and is not rich towards God. So the issue is not being rich towards God. Poor people who are, who are physically poor, financially poor, have temptations too, but, but the issue here is, is of those who, are, who think that they're rich in spiritual things and can fall into the temptation of, of self-reliance instead of dependence on God. Again, they have received the consolation. They've had their best life now. And they're going to experience eternity apart from God. The second woe, woe to the full. Verse 25, woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Now, like we saw with the poor and the hungry being linked, the idea here being full is similar to those who are being rich. But the emphasis here is, is on the, the, the state of the rich. These are not only rich, but they are foolishly content. They feel secure in their wealth. They think they don't have any needs. They think they've got it all. But they will hunger. They're full now. They're, they're, their heart is full of the things of this life, so they have no room to think about the things of eternity. As Palmer says, they are sated with the good things of this life. They, they lack no good thing now, but in the future, they're going to lack everything that is good. Jesus warns about this sort of thinking, doesn't he? He warns about, about not laying up for yourselves treasures on earth, but rather where moth can, can, and it can corrupt and, and, uh, and can, the things can rust and, get, and be stolen, but to lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, eternal treasure. So again, for those who are satisfied with the things this life have to offer, they're not thinking about eternity and the blessings they have of being with Christ forever and ever. 
Third woe. Woe to those who laugh. Woe to you who weep now, for you shall mourn and weep. Again, this is, this is a future thing. It's a, a similar comment can be made for, you, for those who, who laugh now. Sorry, those who, those who laugh now are, are those who... It, it, well, the problem here is not, is not just laughing. It's not about being funny. It's about being, um, about being scornfully and ridiculingly laughing at, at others, laughing at, laughing at eternity, and laughing at the misfortune of others. Derisive laughter, laughing at other people's expense. Now this kind of, of laughter will turn into mourning. We were warned about this, this repeatedly. Look at, at Psalm 73 for a moment. Psalm 73. I had a friend who was, was really comforted um, by this, this psalm where she had, had come to saving faith and um, her ex-boyfriend was a drug dealer. And she had, had rejected that whole lifestyle, but she saw him continuing to, to really just skate through life. And he had the truck, he had the motorcycle, he had the boat, he had the nice house, he had, had all of these things. And, and he was one who was, was really, at, at verse, um, verse, 20, or verse 4 of Psalm 73, they have no pangs until death. The bodies are fat and sleek. They have no trouble like others do. They're, they're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Verse, um, verse 8. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens. Their, tr their tongue, what a picture, their tongue struts through the earth. This is the type of person that is being spoken of here. They laugh now, but their laughter will turn to mourning. Verse 16 of Psalm 73, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I discerned, I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin, how they're destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by tears. And it goes on from there. Those who laugh now will weep. And they will weep not just for a moment, but they will weep for all eternity. The fourth and final woe. Woe to those who are spoken well of. Verse 26. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. It's their fathers. So when you, again, this includes a warning to the disciples, otherwise it would be your fathers. There's a danger when people speak well of you. The, the fear of man is a snare. It's so easy to, to succumb to the fear of man and to go along with what others are doing so you don't cause offense, so you don't ruffle feathers. Either going along with, with what others are, are doing or saying and not making a stand or just, just being a part of what they're doing. Then, then you, people will love you for it. To say, wow, what an easygoing person. I remember a number of, a number of years ago that the, the, the people at my work, it was when I was working at SeaWorld, and, and when, uh, when they were saying that they meant this as a compliment, but, but one of the, the other staff members said, wow, like, you know, you really, you, like, you like our music, and you like all this, this, stuff, this, this stuff, and you're not like this, this other guy who was a, a professing Christian. Now, they meant as a compliment, but that felt like a knife. Made me think, wow, am I not being different? Am I not being different from, from, from what they're doing? And it really caused me to, to stop and think, well, what kind of testimony am I living out in this, in this workplace? It's, again, it's not just being different for the sake of being different, but it's being different because of Christ. And it caused me to take stock 
and the way that I was living my life. This was a, was a really a low point in my faith. And, and by God's grace, I was able to, to God granted me repentance and, and enabled me to, to make some serious changes in the way that I was living my life. So now there is one sense. We don't want to, again, think this is saying more than it says because there's a sense that, that believers should be thought well of by outsiders. 1 Timothy 3, 3, 7 lists this as one of the qualifications for an elder. But this is different from universal popularity. Someone can, can say, well, I don't agree with what this person is doing. I don't like their faith. But I see that they're different, and I respect that. This is, this is how we should seek to live our lives in the world. But again, people approve of, approved of the false prophets. If, if you are approved of universally by those in the world, you are like the false prophets. You are in bad company. The false prophets who would wide acclaim, Jeremiah 5.31 but a true prophet, somebody who stands firm on the word of God, will often be viewed as, uh, of as poorly because of the stand that they're taking. So as we see these, these four beatitudes and these four woes, we're seeing that the world's values are starkly different from God's values. Again, this is, this is not a how-to. This, this is a description of who is. Who is blessed by God. And it, it causes us to stop and to take stock and to question. What are you living for? Are you living for eternal rewards in the presence of Christ? Or for the fleeting earthly pleasures? And future separation from God? Missionary Jim Elliot, who was martyred for his faith, said, Blessed is the man who gives up that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Investing in the present means robbing from the future. Investing from the present means robbing. Investing in the present means robbing from the future. What is more difficult? Rejection now by the world or rejection now? by God for all eternity. J.C. Rao said that there's people who prefer joys and so-called happiness of this world to the joy and peace in believing and will not risk the loss of one in order to gain the other. They are the people who love the praise of men more than the praise of God and will turn their back on Christ rather than not keep step with the world. These are the kind of people whom our Lord had in view when he pronounced the solemn words, woe to you. Now, many of the Jews to whom Jesus spoke and many of the Gentiles to whom Jesus spoke would choose the world instead of Christ. They would choose the world instead of Christ. Despite the fact that they had the scriptures, despite the fact that they, they had seen and heard the ministry of Jesus, many who claimed to be disciples would prove to love the world instead of Jesus. Many in the visible church today will prove to love the world instead of Jesus. Again from Ryle, Ryle, there are thousands who, though convinced of the truth of the gospel, never give up anything for its sake. To all such people, Christ delivers an awful warning. Woe to you. This is the description of those who are separate from Christ. Kama and Bimeshwari Sodi are poor and hungry, and weeping, and hated. But they are blessed. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But if the teaching of the Lord and gospel ministers is true, then it is the worldling who is to be pitied. If you're trying to, to look to the reality of these things, if you're trying to understand the, the, your present in light of eternity, go to Jesus. 
Because Jesus is the one person who has experienced both. Jesus came from the eternal pleasures of heaven to come into this world to experience everything in this world except sin. To live the righteous life that we could never live. And he did this with joy because of the hope that was set before him. Because of the hope that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Do you want to understand what it means to be blessed? Do you want to understand and to reject and to flee from, from the, everything that causes woe? To flee from the wrath of God? Then flee to Christ in repentance and faith. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your perfect righteousness. We praise you, Lord, for you are the blessed one. Lord Jesus, you are the blessed son who gave up temporarily the blessings of heaven to walk through this life out of love for your father, obedience for your father, and love for your people. Lord Jesus, you gave up your life on the cross so that we could experience eternal blessings. So the Father poured out his wrath. The curses of a lawbreaker fell on you in our place. And so in you, we have blessings evermore. Help us, Lord, to look to the blessings that we have in you now, to the blessings that we will have in you in the future. Lord, help us to rejoice in this great salvation that we have in your holy name. Amen.